Okay, this is an example of simultaneous heat and mass transfer. It's uh, quite a common example and quite a practical one, actually. Uh, it is for determining humidities. Okay, so first we should probably define uh, what is a humidity, and usually you see this reported in terms of a relative humidity. Uh, that is the amount of water in the air divided by the amount of water uh, that would be in air that was saturated at the dry or at the ambient temperature. Okay, so um, so we have a little device for actually determining the relative humidity, uh, that is the water content of the air, and and that device works like this: you have air flowing past a uh, a pair of thermometers. One of them is just a standard uh, so-called dry bulb thermometer, and it's going to give you the temperature reading of the air's temperature. And the other one is uh, has its um, the other thermometer is wrapped in a wet uh, cloth. Uh, and and so that wet cloth is going to be uh, is going to there's going to be water evaporating off of the surface of that wet cloth, and and there is a couple of processes that have to happen for the water to evaporate. One, there's a mass transfer process where uh, the water has to you know actually go from the cloth surface out into the air. The other process that is happening is that in order for that evaporation to occur, uh, the air has to supply the latent heat of evaporation to the water on the cloth. And so as a result of that, that tends to cool down uh, the temperature on the, on the uh, cloth. And so the wet bulb thermometer reads this lower temperature uh, set by the balance of these two processes. And we call that temperature the wet bulb temperature. Okay, so what we're going to find is that the difference between the dry bulb temperature and the wet bulb temperature uh, can be uh, quite accurately related to the amount of humidity uh, in the air. Okay, so uh, let's go ahead and uh, think about why that relation exists. Uh, well, we have a mass balance that says that the rate at which water is evaporating off of the uh, off of the wet bulb is given by some mass transfer coefficient, which we don't know. We'd have to know all the details of all the shape of the of the cloth around the wet bulb, but it turns out that all that will vanish. Uh, so, so we have to know the mass transfer coefficient multiplied by the total concentration. Uh, that is, say, uh, at one atmosphere, it's going to be your um, your uh, uh, RT over P, for example, uh, would give you this total concentration, and uh, and so uh, I guess that's a inverse concentration. Uh, you can compute this as 22.4 liters per mole um, inverse at uh, at standard conditions, for example. So that's the total concentration counting both the water and the dry air uh, components of air, and and then we're multiplying that by the uh, the mole fraction of water in the air at, at saturation, that is in contact with the cloth, uh, minus the mole fraction of water in the air out in the bulk, far away from these two thermometers. Okay, so we've also got an energy balance that relates the heat flux uh, in terms of a heat transfer coefficient to the temperature at the interface of the cloth that is going to be um, set by this, this balance of these two processes, uh, minus the temperature out in the bulk far away uh, from the two thermometers. Okay, so these two things are coupled by the latent heat in the following way. Uh, if I know the total rate of evaporation uh, per unit area off the cloth uh, multiplied by the, the latent heat of vaporization, that should be equal to uh, the opposite of the rate of heat transfer to the cloth. Okay, so, uh, so basically what we have then is the following equation that relates a heat trans a mass transfer coefficient times a latent heat times a total concentration times a difference in mole fractions uh, for the composition, <coughs> composition of water at the interface and far away uh, should be equal to a heat transfer coefficient times the difference in temperatures at saturation and which is the interface uh, and the bulk temperature. Okay, so now we can use Chilton and Colburn uh, to relate the heat transfer coefficient and the mass transfer coefficient in this problem. And so the, the relationship there is, uh, is given here. You've got uh, a, your, your Stanton number for mass transfer multiplied by uh, the Schmidt number to the two-thirds. Uh, should be the Stanton number for heat transfer multiplied by the Prantle number for two, per, uh, to the power of two-thirds. Let me uh, redefine my heat capacity so that instead of having units of 
uh, joules per kilogram uh, per Kelvin has units of joules per mole per Kelvin uh, and that allows me to multiply this heat capacity by a total concentration uh, instead of the total density of the air. Okay, so so now this is uh, you know equivalent to the to the relation there in the middle, and and now what we're going to do is combine this Chilton Colburn analogy with the expression that we had above, that is this one. Okay, so if we now combine these two things, uh, we get the following relationship for the uh, the composition, the mole fraction of water out in the in the bulk vapor uh, is equal to the mole fraction of water at saturation minus this factor, this is a positive number, so the mole fraction out in the bulk is always going to be smaller than the uh, mole fraction at the, at the interface of the wet cloth. Okay, so uh, this includes a ratio of Schmidt and Prantl numbers to the power two-thirds. It includes a ratio of the heat capacity to the latent heat, and it includes that temperature difference, and this is what you would read uh, off of the two wet bulb thermometers. Okay, so uh, Kussler goes ahead and crosses off this Schmidt number and Prantl number uh, factor. Um, sorry, that shouldn't be there. I'm not sure why that was there. Uh, Kussler gives this expression uh, that I've got written here now. Uh, so he gives this expression. Uh, this is an approximate expression, but it's a pretty good approximation because uh, the Schmidt number and the Brantel number in the gas phase are both approximately one, and therefore their ratio should also be approximately one. And, uh, and so he simplifies the expression to this. Um, I want to point out uh, a couple of uh, interesting things about this, um, about this result. Uh, I can't, uh, can't get that to uh, come into the frame of my, my little uh, movie here. So let me just go ahead and say it. I want to point out that this expression no longer has a velocity in it, which says that your wet bulb temperature and its relationship to uh, the humidity, which is really in the difference of these two uh, mole fractions of, of uh, water content, um, is th there's no velocity dependence in this equation, right? Uh, which says that no matter how fast the, the air is blowing, whether it's a breezy day or a still day, <coughs> that you should get uh, the same reading uh, for the humidity from this device, which is, which is pretty nice. And also, you'll notice that the, uh, the total concentration in the air uh, actually vanished from the expression as well. Um, so so that, uh, that is telling you that basically this device will work at, at um, you know, wide, wide, wide range of pressures uh, and certainly you don't have to worry about whether you're using this device in Denver or in Santa Barbara. Um, okay, so I think that's it for the wet bulb thermometer. It's a, um, a nice example of simultaneous heat and mass transfer, and I hope that you will recognize that what allowed us to uh, simplify this problem was using this chilton colburn analogy uh, to um, basically cancel off almost entirely the two dependences on heat uh, transfer coefficient and a mass transfer coefficient, and all that was left was this ratio of Schmidt and Prantl numbers in the final expression. Okay, that's it.